Hello. Thank you to everyone here for providing us the opportunity to speak. I'd like to start by asking a question. How would you describe a great musician? I would say someone with music in their head and with the, with the tools to get it out. Piano, guitar, flute, computer. Now imagine you have music in your head all the time and none of the tools fit you. Your fingers don't match the flute holes. The piano is the wrong height. You can't reach around the back of any equipment to plug it in. You've literally been designed out of play. But it's 2017, it's a high tech era. Surely there are a multitude of ways around this. Look at Paralympic sport, for example. Incredible skill, strength, speed, beautiful equipment, and thrilling television. Fantastic prosthetics are available for sport these days. We've seen some today from Matt at MIT, and this is the Otterbock Pro Carve. Also for dance, Lisa Bufano, an amazing dancer who creates her own anthropometric prosthetics for dance pieces. Here's a fact. The music industry in the USA is worth $47.5 billion. Surely Paralympic style design can exist for music. The same level, but surprisingly not. My story into musical instrument design begins with my father, Rolf Gelha. He's also my mentor, my teacher, and my business partner. And I'd like to introduce him once he gets his mic fixed. Thank you. Test, test. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, contrary to what you might think, this is not going to be all about me. However, I'd like to give you a bit of background because I think it will make things clearer as we go along. I was born during the Second World War in Germany, and my mother, I had a very fortunate family. My mother was an arts teacher, and she was very aware of the arts all her life. My father was an aeronautical engineer, and he designed several uh, uh, airplanes and rockets. And after the war, the American government found us and offered him a job. And so we were transported to New Mexico. Now, I, I think I've had three life-changing experiences. This was the first. The world turned from black and white to technicolor. The second came it has to do with this gentleman who sat, sat there, karl Heinz Stockhausen, whose piece, Conductor, I heard for the first time in about 1961, two years after he'd made it. And it completely uh, blew me over. I've been at uni I was at university, I was studying science and philosophy, and I decided that what I really needed to do was make electronic music because there I could do both things at the same time. I worked with him for four years. He invited me to come to Cologne and work with him both as a personal assistant, sounding board, uh, and member of his ensemble. And we traveled all over the world doing concerts of electronic music, because we were about the only live electronic music ensemble in the 60s. One of the things we did was to go to Osaka in 1970, and these are some pictures of that fantastic concert hall. It was built by a, a well-known German architect. The idea was that it was a concert hall. That was the German pavilion. And, but they didn't know what to put into it, and someone uh, cleverly suggested, well, let's do electronic music and get Stockhausen over there. So I went with him, we had 80 loudspeakers, eight channels, and we could put a sound anywhere in the whole, the first time ever, anywhere in the whole space, and Siemens built us all sorts of special equipment to do that. Um, all of that experimenting with sound in volumes led me then when I s stopped working with Stockhausen about four years uh, uh, later, to start experimenting with spatialized sound. And this is an instance 
of a project I did at ILCOM in which I sent pulses into a space which would reconstitute themselves as a, a very multicolored sound. And if you walked around the space, you heard something different everywhere else and you heard the changes. During that time, I was of course working with computers and, and I was working with computers at home and I was composing music with computers. And I was using an, an Apple and printing out data uh, based on probabilistic calculations and so on, which I would then transcribe into notes and durations to use for my orchestral compositions. I had ha had many thoughts about doing electronic music, and one of the stumbling blocks was always that at that time, electronic music really meant playing compositions from tape. F usually four channel tape, you know, very nice loudspeaker set up, and we traveled the world with an eight speaker set up. But I always thought people didn't really want to listen to, um, loudspeakers and have nothing to see. So I had this idea, what I really would like to do is take my composition out of the computer directly into a sound producing device and then people could walk around the space, there would be a system of sensors that would measure their, their, their position and their displacement in the space and that would control the algorithms that made the music. So I came up with the idea called sound space. I suggested this to Ilkam and the Centre Pompidou in 84, and they went for it. So those images there are uh, three installations. The one on the top right was the first one in the Centre Pompidou for a show called Les Immateriaux. The one on the bottom was the design for an installation that was for 10 years in the Musée de la Villette. And the one on the left is the first public installation we did in, in um, uh, that was in Germany. This is one of the sensors. They use ultrasound. They, have a, they can measure 10 meters. If, the, if they detect you, they can tell me exactly where you are in the space, and it gives me a measurement 10 times a second. This is an image of an installation they did here in Toulouse in 1986 with my, one of my, or both of my young sons enjoying it and the Minister of Culture there looking on. Um, I did many installations and then I started doing workshops. And when I was doing the workshops, I started in Lisbon, I did an installation where I worked with disabled children. And this was the, 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 the third life-changing event. Uh, I saw these children in the space and I all of a sudden realized I'd made something they need rather than just making something that I liked making as a composer. So I decided then I was going to revamp the whole thing and change the programming a bit so that it was no longer my music but it was their music. That they could come in move around, do something, and say, ah, that's me. And that they could do something that it would, in a way, reflect how they moved. Out, after this time, for some time, I, I worked all over the world with this thing, traveled around, had a few permanent installations in various cities, still have one in, in Porto at the Casa da Musica. I met Clarence. Clarence was a great, musician. He is a great musician. He was a trumpeter, solo trumpeter of the Northern Symphonia. He had a terrible automobile accident in 1996. I met him in 2000. A common friend suggested, can't I do something for him so that he can play music again? Because he was paralyzed from the neck down. He spent his whole life in a wheelchair as you can see on that picture there on the left. Um, I tried many techniques. In the end, what I did is I created an interface. I gave him a head pointer so that he could point a mouse and move a mouse on the computer screen 
and he could click. And I gave him this instrument, which you can see looks like a musical instrument, at least in part, because there's some keyboards. And this is what he wanted, and he could play with different sounds. Clarence was so excited with this. Uh, about uh, four, four or five years later, we, we were still working together. I was working to improve this. A few friends of mine and Clarence and I decided to form the Para Orchestra, which was a, a first orchestra of disabled musicians, and we played at the Paralympics. There on the left, you can see us in the stadium, and we played uh, for the Queen, and she used the track for her usual Christmas address. And during this time, Vahakan also worked with me, because sometimes but I was the technical director, and I couldn't always do it. So Vahakan would step in for me, and uh, he started contributing to the developments. And whilst my father's background was in fine music and working with great composers, I was, in my beginnings, making poetry radios, art devices that, that had the mind of their own. This poetry radio would print out little poems when it wanted to. This is one of my favorites. Smelly cheese is weird. It's full of bacteria, alive like humans. And I was also making microscope tables to allow people to see and share microscopy together, enlarging things like their finger so they could see the filth between their own fingerprints. And musical chairs that if you sat inside and moved the joystick and sang or spat or hissed into the microphone, you could explore new sound, sound areas. And our first collaboration was Viagem do Elefante, which was in Portugal. What you see here is a choir of residents from the local psychiatric institute that formed the entire choir and series of small schools, groups of musicians that had instruments designed specifically for them that performed in this massive piece that was in Casa da Musica. This is a sensor that controls robot gamelan. And this is an egg box game where people would place eggs in the right order in this little game and the game would release melodies into a massive sound system that was part of the score of this whole piece. And Clarence was of course involved. But this is the para orchestra that Rolf spoke about before. And I'd like to take you on a small design journey of how our devices come to be. Um, Clarence was playing Headspace, staring at a computer and making amazing sounds, but we felt, and he felt, that he'd like to be more connected to his instrument in a physical way. So this is how we went about finding new ways to, find, to allow Clarence to play music. We were spreading notes out in different ways and presenting them to him in a way that he could physically touch. You'll see these models will make sense in a moment. So we quickly mocked up new ways of making keyboards or harmonicas or things that he could touch. And we ended up with this, using bare conductive electric paint and commonly found sensors. We created this harmonica-like device that allowed Clarence to play with a, a wand and a breath sensor so he could touch the different pads. And what you see is a keyboard with all the notes of a normal keyboard in two octaves. If he sucked in, it would play. If he blew out, it would play even lower. And he played this in Qatar with an orchestra. This introduced us to bare paint, a quick way of making keyboards and touchpads. And here I'd like to demo one of the instruments for you. This is called touch chord. And I have what you see on the screen here. I blow out and touch the pads with not much force, it plays a note. And when I combine the root note and these shortcuts for chords, you can play any chord in the, in the spectrum of music. And this is to allow someone to play music that can't physically support a device. And I'd like to let you see a video right now of John Kelly. We look towards open source hardware and sensors to help us develop interfaces to allow control over notes and music via synthesizers with expression, which is really, really the key.
I think it's a really interesting way of kind of composing or coming up with chord shapes in an unfamiliar way. The way they're laid out is this whole other language of sensitivity and, um, and touch, I guess, and texture. As a disabled person, um, I obviously I need some extra flexibility, um, the ability to change the parameters a little bit on, on things so that it can do what I need it to do. But if it does that for me, then it's good for a lot of musicians, um, any musician really. And the more, more from the design journey, this was the beginning of high note, the instrument that Clarence now plays. We made models out of sticks and rubber and linkages, and the way was to try and find him a way of having a mouthpiece that he could move with his head that would register high resolution inside a computer in a, in a low computational way. So we were looking at potentiometers and different linkages that would allow him to play music. Remember that top one, it's a kebab stick. You, would, you might cook with it. You stick vegetables or meat on it to cook with. Um, here's one that we, we got to where it would mount on his chest with magnets, and then it would be a mouthpiece in his mouth that he could then move. Here are some of the very, very early Form 1 3D printed parts. And it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, we got rid of some of the physical components, and then it became wireless. That wire you see actually just goes to a battery using Music Bricks riot sensor. And then it became a headset. So from a wooden stick to test movement to a wireless headset. This is high note. And hi Clarence now plays high note. Working with Clarence is the same as working with any other musician, except with high note and Clarence, we can tailor make the instrument to allow him to really perform. Last year, for the first time, six movements of an orchestra piece were written for Clarence and high note by composer Sevan Horox Hopayan. Between the three of us, we made sounds to help him counter and go with the, the orchestra he was playing with. Rolf's known Clarence for a long time and will tell you a little bit about what Clarence thinks of high note. Well, I mentioned Clarence was a, a, a very gifted musician. And I, there's a few things I'd like to say about it. First of all, it was a great pleasure to work with him because he was so uh, responsive to everything. When he first did the very first concert with an ensemble that they called the Headspace Ensemble because I'd called the instrument Headspace, he said to me, this is the first time I feel like a musician again and not a disabled person. I'd rather make music than walk. So this has been our inspiration ever since I started working with Clarence. And we have a few goals that we would like to pursue that are quite important. Most of our work, we've worked with three different people so far, has been aimed at, that, at the disability of those particular individuals. We would like to develop something more generalizable, generic. One size fits many. And for this, we need a lot of time, because even the, the thing that we've done for, for Clarence took us quite a few years. The other thing I would like to do is do something which we generally call creating a level playing field that a disabled musician can play with able-bodied musician in the same ensemble. The second is that music schools can take disabled youngsters and turn them into musicians. There are currently practically no music schools that have courses for disabled people. One of the reasons is there are not many instruments, except perhaps a computer. But that still is technology which is in its infancy because if it doesn't require a keyboard, it will require special technology for interacting. All of this is exciting. It's revealing and it's very, very hard to do. We're far from the perfect instrument. Clarence still needs help to plug in and switch on. 
Our prototype system, although powerful in places, does not allow Clarence to change sound details himself, and he's one of only three people that we've worked with. We're on a quest to develop beautifully crafted, connectable musical instruments that allow everyone the chance to make music. We want to change music culture forever, and to do this, we need you. We've, we have four years of experience, five years of experience working with disabled musicians, and right now we're open up for collaborations with design institutions, educational institutions, tech research organizations. We're also looking for new players. We're also looking for pro programmers, thinkers, and designers. So if any of the stories we've brought to you today touch you in any way, or you know anyone at all that would be remotely interested in what we're doing, we'd very much like for you to get in touch with us. We want to evolve music culture, and we hope you do too. Thank you very much. Thank you.